Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Craig Thielen. I'm the research, research director here at Citizens Research Council of Michigan. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. As we've done each year for the last half dozen years or so, we are happy to bring you CRC's analysis of the exec executive budget proposal for next year. First, let me remind you who we are. The Citizens Research Council is a statewide nonpartisan public affairs research group. In 2016, we celebrated our 100th year of operation, a longevity we attribute to our promotion of informed public policy for state and local governments through the provision of accurate, independent, objective public affairs research. I want to remind you that we are a private, not-for-profit entity, and we rely on the charitable contributions of foundations, businesses, and corporations. I'd like to encourage all of you to join our circle of supporters and help us to continue to provide high quality, independent information on important policy topics in Michigan. You can learn more about the Research Council at our website, crcmich.org. At the right of your website, you'll find an opportunity to sign up for our email distribution list to be notified about newly released reports. Last Wednesday, Governor Rick Snyder delivered his eighth and final budget recommendation. With the presentation of the executive budget, the governor kicked off the fiscal year 2019 budget development process. The governor's recommendations are now in the hands of the House and Senate Appropriations Committees, where they will be reviewed, evaluated, and adopted, some with modification, some not. The entire process should be completed by early summer before lawmakers hit the campaign trail. The FY 2019 budget takes effect October 1, but for many entities that rely on the budget for some or all of their funding, fiscal years begin earlier on July 1st. The governor's proposed 57 billion all funds budget for 2019 is based on the consensus revenue estimates agreed to in January. Before the budget is adopted by the legislature, the state will convene another revenue conference. This these revenue estimates will form the basis for the final budget. While the state budget totals nearly $57 billion, nearly 40% of this total comes from federal sources, which lawmakers have little control over. A similarly large category of resources in the budget comes from state restricted resources, including transportation and the school aid fund. Lawmakers have limited discretion over these resources. The final major category is the state general fund where budget writers have the most discretion for allocating resources among state programs. The general fund accounts for about 10 billion of the total, roughly 18%. The general fund, along with the major state restricted funds, including the school aid fund, is where much of the debate will take place in the legislature over the coming months as the budget is put together. During today's webinar, we'll walk you through the highlights of the governor's proposal. We, be we begin with a quick summary of the state revenue picture, including forecasts for the coming year. We discuss the current fiscal environment facing the governor. Next, we'll dive into the proposal itself and focus on major appropriation changes from the current year, with a particular uh, attention paid to recommended spending from the two major funds, general fund and school aid fund. Finally, we'll wrap up with the presentation with our assessment of the governor's recommendations and thoughts about the long-term budget forecast. The presentation today will be a tag team effort between myself and Jordan Newton. Before Jordan kicks things off, let me introduce him. Jordan is our primary researcher on state fiscal matters. Jordan comes to CRC about a year ago with a master's degree from Michigan State University and a bachelor in arts in economics from Gonzaga University. Please note that we are recording this webinar and we'll post it on our webpage where it will be available for future viewing. Also, the slide deck is posted under our presentations link on our website. We have everyone but the presenters on mute, so we will not be able to hear you if you speak up. However, to ask a question, and we will take questions at the end, please type your question into the questions pane that should be appearing on your screen. You can type these questions in at any time and we'll address them at the end of the presentation. If for any reason you have technical problems, please let us know by calling 
542-8001. After the webinar, you're going to receive an email soliciting your feedback, and we'd very much appreciate any feedback you have to make our next webinar better. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Jordan. Thank you, Craig. Um, before diving into the details of the budget, it is important to know the financial context surrounding the creation of it. As the general fund is the main discretionary account, uh, it typically sees more competition for resources as, uh, um, as any new program that falls outside of special purpose funds and any existing general fund program will compete for a much more limited resource pool. This also means that when the general fund isn't keeping pace with inflation, existing programs need to compete to get inflationary increases. That being said, the most recent consensus revenue estimating conference for the House and Senate fiscal agencies in the state uh, budget office come together to an agreement on the state economic outlook and estimate revenue moving forward. Uh, this estimate lowered previous projections for the general fund. Last May, the agency's projected general fund revenue for fiscal year, or FY 2019, at about $10.49 billion. In January, during the most recent conference, those agencies lowered their projections to $10.34 billion, or about a $150 million decline. This represents about a 1.5% decline in general fund revenue. This estimate continues a recent trend in the general fund. While the fund is slowly increasing, those increases are not enough to keep with the rate of inflation. Since FY 2015, state general fund resources have increased slightly each year, but once adjusted for the purchasing power of each dollar, revenues for fiscal year 2019 are 3.5% lower than they were in FY 2015. In a more long-term outlook, general fund revenues are still lower than they were in FY 2000. While the actual dollar value in revenue is closing in on 2000 levels, Projected, uh, and they're projected to surpass the 10.6 billion mark in 2022, inflation adjusted revenues are still significantly lower, with FY 2019 projections nearly 35% lower than those collected in FY 2000. As it, as it is, general fund revenue is a long way from recovering from back-to-back -back recessions to start the millennia. Part of the reason for this backslide is a recent trend of removing programs from the general fund. While increases coming out of the Great Recession from 2008 to 2011 increased the general fund as a percent of state dollars that were spent, recent year budgets have reduced general fund spending relative to the school aid fund and other restricted funds. Part of the reason for this has been an increase in diverting money away from the general fund, and part of it is due to the budget increasing at a faster rate than the general budget. A few programs in particular have limited the growth rate of the general fund since FY 2015. The personal property tax, or PPT, reform effort required a compromise. The state would reimburse local governments, who were the primary beneficiaries of the PPT, for revenues that were lost. As the general fund was made responsible for making state governments whole, the entirety of the cost burden came from the general fund. Reducing revenues by $350 million in FY 2017 and $400 million for FY 2019. In addition, the transportation funding package agreed to in 2015 begins to draw resources from the general fund starting in FY 2019. The homestead property tax credit, which was agreed to in order to limit the tax incidence of fuel taxes and registration fee increases on lower income families due to the transportation package, also begins to reduce general fund revenues in FY 2019. So while the available pool of general fund dollars isn't growing, it's important to note that this isn't an issue of fund growth as potential revenue it is growing. It is an issue of significant portions of general fund revenue being redirected to other funds. Once those phase-ins are complete in FY 2022, the general fund is expected to begin growing faster than inflation. Until then, however, the general fund will tighten and many programs will not see even inflationary growth. Unlike the general fund, the school aid fund is expected to see somewhat strong growth over the next few years. So much so that January's consensus revenue estimating conference increased projections for the fund by more than 100 million for each year. From FY 2017 to 2022, the school aid fund is expected to grow at an average rate of just under 3% annually. Uh, 
While the school aid fund did not experience the dramatic decline in actual dollars that general fund faced during the 2000s economic declines, it still has declined relative to 2000 once adjusted for inflation. Despite growth in the majority of years since FY2000, FY 2019 is projected to be about 8% lower than FY 2000 revenue levels once adjusted. So even though the school aid fund fared better than the general fund during Michigan's back-to-back -back recessions, it is still not at its peak. The executive budget's appropriation requests reflect these general revenue trends. The request for the general fund declined slightly. With a significant portion of the new potential revenue being diverted or returned to taxpayers, there was not room for much of an increase. The school aid fund is likely to see a modest increase, and overall funding from state sources will be up about $600 million. Total federal dollars declined by nearly half a billion, in large part uh, due to declining uh, spending within the EHHS. Uh, this is also due to a, particularly a reduction in the food assistance program as caseloads in Michigan have declined significantly over the past four years. Because federal spending is going to decline at su such a significant rate, overall appropriations for FY 2019 are only up three-tenths of a percent from FY 2018, despite the 1.9 percent increase in total state resources. Uh, there are a few line changes for the general fund. While the revenue is expected to be increased by about $30 million, uh, the beginning balance is about $400 million lower. This is reflected in the overall budget. While ongoing expenditures are expected to increase slightly, one-time expenditures were higher, and the state made a deposit into the rainy day account in FY2018, neither of which are returning in FY 2019. The decline in one-time measures leaves the overall general fund appropriation for FY 2019 lower than the previous fiscal year. The expected year-end balance for FY 2019 is all expected to nearly exhaust the remaining balance in the general fund. The FY 2019 budget continues the trend for the school aid fund continues the trend of adding burden from higher education spending to the school aid fund, with nearly 150 million in additional appropriations for the year. School aid and community college funding will increase slightly, while a deposit into the Minister's Reserve is not appropriated for this fiscal year. In all, spending is up by about $160 million, and reserves are expected to decline from the $97 million at the start of fiscal year to $6 million at the close of FY 2019. And with that, I'll turn it back to Craig to discuss some of the highlights of the school aid fund. Thank you, Jordan. I'm going to take a few minutes and go over the education uh, portions of the, the budget, including the K through 12 appropriations, as well as the post-secondary uh, education appropriations. I'll begin with the K-12 overview. Um, state Total state funding for K through 12 is just under $13 billion, a slight uptick from the 2018 levels. Um, this is going to be to support a, a, a smaller, slightly smaller student enrollment, um, which has been an ongoing uh, trend in Michigan as public school enrollment has declined from about 1.7 uh, million students in the middle part of the, the last decade to just under 1.5 million students today. Um, we see uh, continued funding going to the retirement system, uh, which is drawing resources uh, away from other uh, K through 12 appropriations. And then as Jordan alluded to, and I'll hit on in more detail here, uh, we see uh, continued and increased use of the school aid fund to support the higher education appropriations. The highlights in the governor's proposal focus on uh, three main areas, uh, increases in the foundation allowance, uh, key reductions to uh, cyber schools, as well as reductions uh, in appropriations that support the attendance of non-public school students at public schools, and then uh, increases in funding for the teacher retirement system. To the foundation allowance, uh, the governor is proposing one of the largest increases in recent memory. Um, he is uh, advocating a 200 and 
uh, $40 per pupil increase in the foundation grant for those districts that are at the minimum level. Um, and for those at the top portion, the maximum grant, they would receive $120 per pupil increase. Uh, with those districts in between the minimum and the maximum, they would get somewhere between that 120 and 240 per pupil increase using the 2x formula. Um, by using this mechanism, uh, the gap between the minimum and the maximum gra grants uh, obviously decline. Uh, it'll decline to uh, about $538 under the governor's proposal, uh, almost half of what it was or more than half of what it was in 2011 when uh, Governor Snyder took office. Uh, in terms of the number of pupils affected, over two-thirds of the pupils in Michigan will be receiving the minimum foundation allowance in 2019 under this proposal. The total cost increase uh, for this uh, large uh, foundation grant uh, bump is $312 million uh, in resources out of the school aid fund. And to finance that, we see reductions elsewhere in the budget. Namely, in the foundation allowances provided to two groups of students. Those students attending cyber charter schools and those students who are enrolled in public schools but receive the majority of their education in non-public school settings, both uh, private and parochial schools. Cyber charters, um, the foundation for uh, all students enrolled in cyber charters would be reduced by 25%, so they would effectively receive a 75% uh, allotment of the allowance, uh, foundation allowance, or $5,903. Um, across all enrollment in cyber charters, this represents about a $25 million reduction statewide. Um, in terms of the foundation grants for non-public school students that are enrolled in shared time, and just to remind you, the shared time program uh, is a long-standing program that allows uh, non-public school students to enroll in uh, uh, public schools and receive programming in non-elective, non-core courses, things like art, band, gym, um, foreign languages. Uh, the total uh, in the current year for this program is about $132 million. On it, uh, if you look at the foundation grants uh, that are paid out for this program, uh, the governor's proposal rec recommends uh, capping that at uh, $64 million, a savings of about $68 million statewide. The cap is put in place um, in a couple of different ways. First, uh, the, it restricts the total enrollment that a district is able to claim for shared time students to 5%. Um, it also prohibits uh, districts from enrolling kindergarten students in their shared time program and limiting shared time only to grades 1 through 12. And uh, also, part of the budget uh, recommendation as for shared time, the uh, programming that is made available to shared time students uh, must also be available to the majority of the uh, district's uh, regular students or full-time uh, students that are enrolled. Uh, this would act as a, another limiting factor on the shared time program. If we look over time, uh, we can see uh, that the growth in shared time has been impressive. Uh, there's an estimate of 17,200 FTE students enrolled statewide in this program in 2018. Since 2011, enrollment is up over 260%. Uh, a lot of this is aided by policy changes um, that the state has enacted, including opening up the program to kindergarten students. Uh, it is important to note, however, that uh, the total enrollment in this program is small relative to the total public school enrollment in the state, only about 1% as of 2016. However, for a number of districts, this does account for a significant portion of their enrollment. Eight districts in the state, uh, it represents 10% or more of their total enrollment. And in 10 districts, they account, those 
districts uh, in aggregate account for over 50% of the total shared time enrollment in the state. It's estimated that the governor's 5% enrollment cap for the program would affect 24 districts. So this vast majority of the savings would come from the foundation grants uh, currently claimed by those 24 districts. Another area of funding increase that I mentioned is uh, state allocations for the teacher retirement system. Um, the budget reflects uh, additional funding for recent reforms that are designed to uh, control future growth of, of, of debt in this system, um, as well as modifying the benefits that are available to uh, public school teachers. Uh, the reforms have largely aimed to hold districts harmless from the uh, additional uh, contributions to the system that are required from the reforms. Uh, if you recall, two years ago, uh, and beginning with the budget that's currently in place, the governor called for a phase in, in, a, in of a lower uh, 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 return on investment assumption. The investments in the retirement system were assuming an 8% annual return. Uh, experience proved that they weren't hitting that mark and they lowered that uh, assumption uh, by one half of a percentage point, but phase that in over two years, this current year and next year. So next year, uh, the budget has to accommodate that lower uh, investment uh, rate of return in sub assumption, and therefore there's some additional costs, 145 million in next year's budget. Um, last year, uh, the legislature enacted uh, a new defined contribution plan for school employees, which uh, has a uh, slightly larger employer uh, contribution to the, the base plan, as well as a uh, new uh, hybrid plan, be, uh, mix of a defined contribution and a pension plan. Those reforms that were enacted uh, last year require this higher employer match and to shield the school districts from the effects of that, uh, the school aid fund is picking up uh, those additional costs, which are estimated to be an additional $15 million in 2019. Uh, the budget has maintained for the since 2012 a uh, categorical uh, appropriation for uh, school districts to help them with their overall retirement costs. Uh, the governor continues that at $100 million. If that money were spread across um, all public school students in the state, it represents about a 67 per pupil uh, allocation, $67 per pupil allocation. Um, the 2018 budget had a $200 million uh, uh, principal payment on the uh, legacy costs for the retirement system. That one-time uh, appropriation is removed in the governor's recommendation. So excluding this one-time payment, the total state contributions to the system for uh, 2019 are up uh, about $126 million over current year. This chart here shows you the history um, uh, of the state contributions to the retirement system. Uh, as you can see, uh, the number has grown significantly since 2012 and approaches 1.3 billion in 2019. Uh, the largest component of this uh, has been the rate cap contribution. Uh, this is designed to provide school districts with more certainty in their budget planning as their uh, uh, exposure to the legacy costs of the system are capped at a fixed percentage of their uh, payroll base. Um, that number, uh, that appropriation has grown up to about $900 million uh, in 2017 and has, uh, is declining and will level out at just uh, about $850 million for a number of years here. Um, and then you can see uh, in 2018 and 2019, uh, some of the changes uh, coming on board with uh, new retirement plans, as well as changes in assumptions surrounding the rate of return and the effects that 
uh, those policy changes have on the state's contribution to the teacher's retirement system. If we turn quickly and look at kind of how these uh, state contributions play out uh, and on a per pupil basis, uh, this chart helps show that. Uh, what I've done here is I've taken uh, just the legacy costs, so those costs um, that the employer is picking up and the state is picking up through the cap on the uh, unfunded liability payment and looked at you know, how is this played out on a per pupil funding level. And what we can see is uh, in total in 2019, about two thousand, a little over two thousand dollars per pupil is being contributed uh, to satisfy the legacy debts of the system. That leaves approximately sixty-five hundred dollars of discretionary foundation resources uh, for districts to use. Again, these are averages. Uh, districts are going to vary based on uh, their share of the overall teacher retirement uh, payroll. But this is an average figure. Uh, that sixty-five hundred dollar uh, amount has grown in recent years. It was as low as about $5,700 in 2012. Um, uh, however, if you look back to 2011, um, the uh, $6,500 is just uh, about $150 over what the discretionary resources and the uh, foundation uh, provided. Real quickly, let me highlight some of the uh, post-secondary education funding uh, recommendations the governor has. Uh, for the 15 public universities, uh, the governor has a inflationary increase of about 1.8%, which totals $29 million. Uh, this money would be allocated through the existing performance funding formula. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, the way that formula works is one half is allocated on a proportional basis to each of the universities based on their 2011 base funding shares. The other half of the uh, $29 million would be allocated on some uh, specific measures uh, including the number of degree completions and the institution's R&D spending. Uh, when you run the numbers through the formula, individual school funding increases range from about 1.5%, just below uh, the overall uh, uh, appropriation increase of 1.8 to 3.1%. Um, the additional funds, again, are conditioned on the universities holding the line on their tuition increases. Uh, for next year, the uh, cap on tuition is set at 3.8%, or $490 per student. Um, and then, uh, again, hitting on this point that the school aid fund is taking on a larger share of what was formerly general fund responsibility, uh, the governor's recommending a $120 million fund shift uh, in the university operating appropriation um, and, and replacing the general fund there and moving it to other areas of the budget. This brings the total university uh, school aid uh, appropriation to 386 million. On the community colleges front, uh, the operations funding for the 28 universities is held constant at the 2018 level, which is about $319 million. Uh, in lieu of this increase, the governor again is proposing uh, to have the colleges use uh, additional resources that they will receive under the personal property tax reforms in 2014 to offset increases in state appropriations. Uh, just as a reminder, the community colleges uh, would receive 100% reimbursement for their lost revenue. Um, the state law, the way it's set up, requires any excess of that personal property tax, those uh, funds that the state is reimbursing locals to be distributed pursuant to a statutory formula. Uh, in that statutory formula in the current year, 24 of the 28 colleges shared in an additional $24 million. Um, the governor, as part of his proposal to 
uh, uh, fund the university, the colleges with the excess uh, PPT and to make that uh, formula a little more fair, the governor is recommending changes to the distribution and that would provide um, the uh, community colleges with about 15% of the 153 million excess that's estimated for next year. Uh, of that 153, the community colleges share is about $20 million. That $20 million would then be distributed across all of the community colleges, not just the 24 that received it in the current year, but all community colleges based on a share of their total appropriation. So before turning things back over to Jordan, I, I do want to hit on this chart. Um, this is the effects of the school aid fund and general fund um, appropriations in higher education over time. Uh, and what you can see is uh, a significant uh, change in, in budget policy with respect to uh, using the school aid fund uh, to support the uh, community college higher education appropriations. Uh, in the proposal that the governor's put forward, uh, just under 800 million in total would go to support community colleges and the universities. This is up from 460 million in his first budget. Um, and then just to compare that with the general fund resources that are going directly into the K-12 side, um, well, the numbers kind of bounced around um, in recent years. Uh, in the proposal that the governor has, uh, the number is being brought down from the current year amount of 200 million to 45 million. So at the same time, we see the school aid uh, picking up a larger share of the universities. We see the general fund picking up a smaller share of the overall K-12 financing picture. Uh, just to recap, at a 50,000 feet level. Uh, there's an emphasis in this budget on increasing the per pupil funding. Uh, that's the 2X formula. Uh, district increases from 120 per pupil to 240 per pupil. Uh, the governor is uh, uh, recommends uh, this would be the largest increase going back to uh, 2000 and two. Uh, there's additional funding to meet the retirement system uh, obligations uh, to hold districts harmless, but it is important to point out that these are resources that are coming directly off the top of the school aid fund and not out of an, another state resource. So uh, if they were run through uh, the foundation grant uh, as opposed to off the top, uh, the, the the difference was, would be minimal in terms of its overall effect on uh, K-12 uh, financing. Um, and then again, we see an expanded use of the school aid fund for higher education to ease the general fund budget pressures that Jordan alluded to earlier in the presentation. And with that, we'll start to take a look at the outlook for the general fund based on the governor's proposed budget. One of the biggest issues facing the governor in this budget process is the diversion of money from the general fund. As somewhat discussed earlier, this is the first budget that the transportation funding package and the expansion of the homestead property tax credit will take effect. We are also still experiencing an expansion of refunds for local governments for the personal property tax reform effort. This is slowing down revenue growth in the general fund. Revenues will average about seven tenths of a percent in growth rate over the next three years, while inflation is expected to be nearly two percent over the same time period. This makes a large makes large scale changes in the general fund difficult, whether it be a new program that requires spending or an attempt to lower taxes, and makes other pro existing programs that need inflationary increases at risk of not receiving those. The transportation package passed by the legislature in 2015 included two funding mechanisms, a $600 million annual funding from an increase in registration fees and fuel taxes, and $600 million each year in diversions from the general fund. FY 2019 begins the phase in of the general fund portion of this funding with $150 million allocated to improve the roads. This is reflected in the governor's executive budget. Additionally, 
the governor has allocated 175 million of uh, lapsed 2017 fiscal year dollars to bring FY 2019 in line with the scheduled FY 2020 proposal. There is currently an effort between the legislature and the governor to try to move this money to FY 2018. So it may not take place in the FY 2019 budget, but currently the governor is requesting that money for FY 2019 through the executive budget. In conjunction with the increased funding for Michigan's roads, the legislature expanded the homestead property tax credit to limit the tax burden of increased fuel costs and registration fees on lower income households. Among the changes, the expansion increased the income cap for eligible homeowners to $60,000, reduced the contribution point where a homeowner would start earning credits, and indexed the maximum property value to inflation. These changes start taking place for tax year 2018, which will primarily affect FY 2019 revenue. This will, is expected to lower general fund projections by about $200 million this year, or this coming fiscal year. While there aren't too many major policy proposals in this year's general fund budget, there are a few smaller changes to note. First, there are about $130 million in reductions being made from previous year's fiscal year. These include a closure of prison, of the closure of a prison in Muskegon, reduction in DHHS spending due to some federal Medicaid pass-through rule changes, and a scale down of IT investments. There were about $110 million in increases coming from additional funding to the Indigent Defense Commission, about $14 million in increased costs to improve food quality in state prisons, $7 million in additional payments to rural hospitals, and $8 million to clean up PFAS, a toxic byproduct of certain industrial activities. One of the few major changes proposed by the Snyder budget was a renewal of funding provided to two expiring environmental bonds. The first bond, the Environmental Protection Bond, provided funding for brownfields to clean up brown sites or locations that are perceived to be contaminated by industrial activity that are no longer active and to manage waste systems in the state. The second, the Clean Michigan Initiative Bond, was responsible primarily for improving and monitoring state water quality. To resolve the drop in uh, these two bonds, the governor proposed increasing the landfill dumping costs from 12 cents per cubic yard, which equates to about 36 cents per ton, to $4.75 per ton. This would raise Michigan from the lowest nationally to the median rate for the Midwest, equal to Ohio. This money would provide a non-bond mechanism to fund similar programs to the Environmental Protection Bond and the Clean, Initiative, Clean Michigan Initiative Bond. $45 million would be allocated to clean up brownfield sites, $24 million to manage wastewater, and additional money for water quality monitoring and park infrastructure. None of this would alter GF, GP or general fund revenue streams as all revenue would come from the increased landfill dumping fee. The Michigan Indigent Defense Commission, which was created to set new standards for the state's defense system for the poor, has begun to implement its first wave of standards. To comply with the Headley Amendment rules preventing increased local cost shares from new state mandates, the state needs to provide some funding for localities to meet these standards. Governor Snyder's budget allocates $61.3 million for these improvements, $46 million from the general fund, and the remainder is expected to come from payments from partially indigent defendants. The request will also provide some reforms for the Indigent Defense Commission, such as lining up deadlines with the state fiscal year and establishing a minimum payment amount localities must reach for their systems. Another major issue effort the Snyder budget undertakes is to deal with excess dollars from the personal property tax revenue. As Craig began to describe, in an attempt to improve the tax climate for the state, the legislature phased out taxes on certain personal industrial property. However, most of the revenue was collected by localities, so to prevent local governments from losing significant sources of revenue, the legislation included a diversion of use tax dollars to local governments that would have otherwise lost revenue. The allocation overshot the amount of revenue needed to be returned to local units by about $150 million. The current allocation meant that localities that did not lose out on personal property tax revenue saw nothing, while those that did collectively saw a $150 million windfall. 
the governor is proposing to adjust how to deal with these excess dollars. Under the new proposal, Under the new proposal after, localities after localities are reimbursed in full, the excess money would enter a new distribution. The first $15 million would go to replace expiring fire protection grants, which go to localities that provide fire protection services to large areas of state property. The remainder would be distributed on a per capita basis to local units of government based on the percentage for each uh, level of, as shown on the screen. To lower administrative costs, each local unit must receive a minimum of $4,500 to receive a payment. On a broader level, there is very minimal change in state revenue sharing with local governments. Constitutional revenue sharing increased by 3.1% from FY 2018 levels, which resulted in about a $25 million change. Non-constitutional payments overall were lowered, 6.2 million in statutory revenue sharing was not renewed, and a 5.8 million one-time appropriation from FY 2018 is now off the books. County revenue sharing also dropped a total of 1.9 million, with three additional counties that exhausted reserve funds being brought back into the equation for that distribution along with the drop. In total, revenue sharing will reach about $1.3 billion in FY 2019. With this being the final executive budget of the Snyder administration, we are going to reflect a little bit on the governor's previous budgets. Overall, Governor Snyder's budgets have been one of maintaining timely, balanced budgets. During These budgets during his administration lacked deficits and brought some stability to the state financial situation after a difficult decade financially and economically. This is especially true given the slow general growth or slow growth in the general fund over the last few years. One major trend that has also been noticed is that the school aid fund has picked up a significantly larger portion of community college and higher education spending as a whole, something that is explicitly allowed within the Constitution, but has shifted a large burden of funds from the general fund to the school aid fund. Much has also been made about reducing state debt during the administration. Much of the primary focus has been on the teacher retirement system, but this is also being shown by some of the planning being done in this fiscal year's budget when excess money from FY 2017 is being outlay, used for capital outlay projects instead of allowing uh, new debt to be generated in the future. And finally, the rainy day fund, which was exhausted during the state's turbulent 2000s, has been somewhat restored during the administration as it ex is expected to close at more than $900 million after FY 2019 ends. Finally, in terms of long-term appropriations, the last decade has shown slow but steady revenue growth for most major areas of the budget, despite the challenges of the Great Recession. The Department of Corrections and Higher, or the Department of Corrections and Higher Education are the two main exceptions. Both have declined since fiscal year 2008. Uh, corrections has mostly declined due to declining prisoner populations where higher education spending has kind of been left to be cut and reduced uh, as uh, tuitions have risen and the need has not been, uh, for, there has not been as much need for increased funding as with other programs. And with that, and with that we will take any questions that you have. I'll turn it over to Craig. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, I am looking to see if we have any questions in our question pane. And if none come in here in the next couple minutes. Oh, we got one here. Give me a second here. Whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Kent County is very concerned with the $7.25 per capita proposed for indigent defense. This would result in a minimum cost of $4.6 million when our total program costs, even when complying with the new standards, is only $3.1 million. We would be required to absorb all increases in program costs and would be an unfunded mandate. I'd be interested in any thoughts on this. Thank you. This is a question related to the 
indigent defense appropriation and the effect in Kent County, Jordan? Uh, yeah, I do think that is a potential concern for the hard uh, cap on spending per uh, capita, it, especially for larger uh, counties it can create a little bit higher of a burden and so that is something that will have to be uh, studied a little bit further before it, uh, the state actually looks to implement it um, do you have any other thoughts on that Greg no? Okay. No. any other questions out there I don't see any further questions. I would like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the webinar has been recorded and will be posted uh, if you want to share that at a later date. Um, also, I encourage you to uh, complete our survey that will come out um, afterwards, and we look forward to your feedback. Um, Thank you again for attending and have a great day.